Uh, thanks for coming tonight. Uh, we, appreciate, we appreciate you uh, being here, and uh, hopefully tonight we'll provide you with some uh, information and some education about some things that uh, you didn't know before you came tonight. Um, so with that having been said, let me uh, begin here with uh, a couple of things. Uh, first thing uh, that I'm going to talk about, first items that I'm going to talk about are uh, some pending uh, legislative matters. And uh, uh, if you've been kind of paying attention, a lot of these have been actually gotten uh, some uh, news media attention. And so uh, you may be aware of uh, some of those. And uh, I've been filling in at some town board meetings here recently. And I know that the town board meetings that I went to, uh, some of these things were uh, talked about and discussed. The first one is this uh, idea of a countywide assessment proposal. Uh, this uh, was part of the governor's budget uh, originally. It's my understanding that now that's been removed from the budget, but it may come back in a different uh, version as a standalone deal later on in the uh, legislative year. But the idea is, is that you know, currently uh, every municipality, all the towns, all the villages, all the cities, uh, all have their own assessor. And uh, you have your board of reviews, which uh, sometimes aren't the most favorite thing for uh, officials to be at, but you have your board of reviews and, it, and it's a local it's, it's local, I wouldn't say local control, but you're in touch with it locally. I mean, generally you're gonna know the uh, property owners that come in, uh, you're gonna know the issues, and uh, uh, you know, it's just, it has that local touch to it. Uh, for whatever reason, uh, there was this proposal to move it to the county level. I, I'm not quite sure what was uh, motivating that. Some of the some of the things that I read had talked about various areas of the state where they had the assessors just weren't very good. Well, um, that that may be the case. I've I've not you know we've not had that experience up here in this part of the state, and uh, uh, and since people in Madison a lot of times think that uh, Wisconsin ends at the Dells, it's hard for them to realize that this part of the state might be a little bit different than it is in in Madison and Milwaukee. But uh, uh, in any event, uh, that was a proposal. Uh, there, you know, some of the other things I read uh, indicated that that might be an increased cost for the for the local municipalities, uh, and so uh, I, I think there's been a, a fair amount of pushback on that, and that's maybe why it came out of the budget, and so that it'll get treated as a separate item uh, down the road. So that was the first item. The next one uh, is on the implements of husbandry, and Tim uh, O'Brien, my partner, uh, is going to speak on that here in a little bit. Uh, but the proposal for that is really a trailer bill. And a trailer bill is a lot of times when there's new legislation addressing a new topic, you know, they, the legislature gives it its best shot, but they don't get it quite right. And they don't realize they didn't get it quite right until it actually gets implemented. And people are trying to administer it and trying to enforce it. And they realize that, uh, you know, it just doesn't work. And so then the legislature gets back and they just, they don't want to change the main focus or the substantive uh, provisions of it, but they want to clear up some of the uh, ambiguities maybe that uh, uh, arose uh, when they passed the initial legislation. So uh, this, that particular piece is really trying to clarify and do some modifications based on the first, uh, um, the first attempt at that particular legislation. Oh, okay. Uh, Next uh, item, uh, the posting of legal notices. Uh, you know, we're in an ever-changing uh, technology world. Uh, and uh, so what this does is it, it really just gives an additional option to municipalities such that you have the option to then uh, to publish on your website and uh, one other location in the municipality. Uh, you know, I was at a town board meeting here a week and a half ago and you know they looked at that. Uh, the clerk just looked at this as a great time saver because the three locations they had in the town, she'd have to get in her car, and it doesn't matter what time of the year it is or whatever, and post it in three different locations. Just took time and effort to do that, and uh, and so now uh, this proposal would have that you could publish in uh, simply one location. So then it was typically, she was planning to do it at the town hall. And then, uh, so she just had to walk outside and put it in their uh, display booth. And then uh, uh, also on your website. 
the one thing to keep in mind is that this doesn't change the requirement uh, for uh, certain things, certain notices. Statute requires that they be published, you know, as a single notice or as a, uh, you know, class two notice, which means it needs to get published two times, that have to be actually published in a newspaper. And so it doesn't change that. So, so for example, uh, if you had a, uh, a notice on a uh, uh, change in the ordinances, a zoning change or whatever, you know, you couldn't just put that up on the website and post it and figure you were good. Uh, to the extent that they require a publication in the newspaper, that would stay the same. This proposed legislation uh, would not change that. Uh, next item is uh, tax refund intercept. Uh, I happen to live in the village of Baldwin and have had the uh, 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 fortune or misfortune of trying to collect bills for the ambulance service. Uh, a lot of them are on items that uh, for out on the interstate uh, near Baldwin because uh, it runs right through uh, kind of the south edge of the village. And so uh, this gives the ability uh, for those municipalities to collect for, you know, ambulance services uh, are, you know, it's tough to fund those and, and make that all work and make the budget work for those uh, in municipalities. And so uh, this is, you know, it, it's a good deal for the ambulance services to be able to collect them in this manner. So uh, that would be, uh, that would be a great improvement, uh, a big help to those services uh, uh, that they provide. Uh, next, uh, shoreland zoning. Uh, shoreland zoning and lake property and issues around that are, are, are always a hot topic. And uh, the, this Hedgewood case, which I'm going to talk about in a little bit, uh, uh, dealt with the issue of, okay, who's going to write the rules here? Is it the county that's going to write the rules? Or is it the town that's going to write the rules? And uh, when they're conflicting, who, who wins that battle? And so uh, this bill tries to clarify some things with respect to that uh, based on that Hedgewood case and uh, it, trying to outline who's going to have the final say with respect to shoreland, uh, shoreland zoning. So uh, that is an, a, a kind of a response to the decision in the Hedgewood Town of Eagle case. Uh, the next uh, matter, again, I, in part, uh, at least in my mind, it relates to some of the things that have happened with respect to legislation uh, surrounding the unions and, and that type of thing. And, and it, it, the prevailing wage rate really is the wage rate that you have to use when you're doing a public project. And typically, the prevailing wage is the union scale because that, that's the broader, the broader base and where they actually have some numbers that they can measure. And so the prevailing wage is typically uh, the union scale. And so what this legislation would uh, do is it would say that for public projects, you don't need to follow the prevailing wage, which true, it would reduce uh, the cost in some circumstances. The argument on the other side is that, well, maybe you don't get as good a quality of contractors that are performing that work. Typically that work is uh, from a municipal standpoint when that applies, you already have to be over kind of the, the limit for uh, uh, those projects uh, uh, and then uh, the dollar limit. And then generally they're significant projects. I mean, you're talking about uh, building construction, you're talking about utility construction, you're talking about road construction. So, you know, it, it's, not, it's not the kind of thing where, you know, uh, you know, you're doing a kind of a major utility project in a, in a village. Uh, and, you know, you've got somebody that's going to bid it that, uh, uh, you know, is going to have one backhoe and, a, and a, you know, something like that to come out and do it. So, uh, but there, there has been a fair amount of discussion back and forth and some news media attention uh, to that particular proposed change uh, also. Uh, next one is on the elimination of the personal property tax. Uh, uh, you know, right now, the way that that works, it's... Uh, it's uh, it's a self-reporting uh, uh, particular item as far as determining what the value of the personal property is. I know that at our office every year, I have to look at uh, our uh, uh, administrator takes and puts together this uh, sheet and it talks, you know, what personal property we have, what's the value of it, and then, then we mail it into the uh, municipality and that's, you know, how the personal property tax gets determined. Uh, one of the comments that I read about was that, well, they thought that that process was too cumbersome, it takes too long to collect it, and so, well, we ought to just do away with it. 
you know, I guess my thought was that uh, I agree that it's probably a little bit of a cumbersome process. And but if you're talking about uh, you know a budget deficit, I don't I don't see where cutting out taxes and then having a budget deficit are necessarily going to go hand in hand. So I'm not quite sure where that's all going to go, but uh, we we will see. Uh, last thing on the on the legislative side uh, has to do with whether a uh, clerk can handle uh, voter registration on election day, and I think this just must have come up in a few municipalities, and I'm sure why this this bill uh, is proposed, uh, and it, it provides that uh, if the clerk is not on the ballot, then then they can uh, assist in that process. And you know, a lot of times it's just hard finding people to have the time to volunteer and participate in that election process, and so uh, that's why uh, I'm sure that the clerk is there, and they want to be able to use their help. Uh, when that's the case. So those are uh, some of the, the things that are uh, coming from down in Madison, and uh, we'll see how they they go and how the course the, the course that they run uh, between now and the end of the legislative session. Uh, in these uh, beginning materials, another thing that's on there uh, is this uh, one of the sheets is municipal land use regulation training opportunities. This was just some things that. Uh, uh, we put in there some additional uh, educational opportunities on uh, various topics that are in the area and uh, uh, looked like they might be uh, worthwhile to attend. And so we've included those in there for your uh, for your information. And which which reminds me that with respect to uh, I need to give some thanks for uh, Terry Dunst, who's uh, in our office, and uh, Jeff, uh, our law clerk, uh, in helping me put together these materials because. Uh, uh, they did the lion's share of getting this thing together for me, and uh, I appreciate that. And uh, uh, so, uh, thanks to them for that. So, next next item uh, cases. So, one of the cases. Uh, let's talk first of all about this uh, uh, Hedgewood case uh, that now we're having some legislation to uh, uh, take and look at, kind of reversing the decision in that case. So again, as I indicated earlier, this had to do with uh, shoreland zoning, and you know, uh, it just seemed you know I think I think seventy five percent of the cases that come up with respect to zoning and setbacks and that type of thing probably all relate to lake property. I mean, lake property that's just where they come up, and. Uh, and it's because I think that you know people are attached to every square foot of uh, property that they have on a lake. Uh, it's uh, uh, you know they've got uh, their family cabins that have been handed down for decades, and you know it, it just you know and they want to use them the way they want to use them. And inevitably, people do things, and then they realize that maybe they should check the regulations and. This case is no exception with respect to that, and you know, uh, and one other thing, and and you know, this is kind of like the the shoemaker's kids, and I'm a shoemaker's kid, I guess. Uh, you know, these boundaries on lake property. I, every client that I have that buying a piece of lake property, I said, I say, you need to have a survey, and it, even if it's a platted lot, you need to get somebody out there with. Uh, metal detector or get a surveyor, somebody go out there and find those points and figure out where they are. Because, you know, people will be fighting over something that's the width of this podium if it's on the lakeshore. And, you know, on various lakes in this area, you know, it could be, you know, the, the price per foot on the lakeshore is $1,500 or $1,800 or $2,000, depending on which particular lake you happen to be. And so I tell them, find out, get that survey before you buy it, and get that established. and Find out if there's been disputes with the neighbors ahead of time. Get that all figured out. So I tell them all that. So I buy a lake property back in 2000. <laughs> Do I get a survey? No. I haven't had any dispute. I've had great neighbors. But uh, I am in the process now of kind of redoing that cabin. And so actually I was walking in here uh, tonight and I got a call from uh, uh, the county up north. I'm in Barron County. Up by, I'm in Cumberland. And it was the uh, uh, it was the guy from the county zoning office, and I had uh, taken the cabin down over this winter, and uh, 
I went up there with my builder last weekend, and I we took our 100-foot tape out, and we measured, and and uh, uh, we took and we put some stakes in the ground and, and all of that. And uh, so I called him up, the county guy, on Monday, and I said, you know, we've got them in. You know, I, he's been out there a couple times already. I said, do you need me to come up there? Or can you just go out and look at it and tell me if it's okay or not? And uh, uh, he called me and said, I'm just out there today. It looks good. So one one thing down on the on the building project, but I can tell you that over the years, I've probably had a half a dozen lake properties with people with decks that build the deck. The neighbor complains. They're way over what the setback is. and they spend five times the cost of the deck, plus they're mad at their neighbors. They never have fun at the cabin anymore. And so it just, you know, it just, when people have it, you just need to think, okay, there are these rules. We probably ought to abide by them, and uh, life will be a lot better. In any event, Mr. Hedgewood, he didn't follow that advice. He built uh, his uh, outdoor fireplace and kind of little... Uh, screened in pergola type thing and put it up and then somebody must have tipped him off and so he then went to the county uh, because uh, it's out in the township but he went to the county and asked permission from them and the county said okay uh, he needed a variance because he was violating the 20-foot setback and the, the county said well uh, you're okay we'll allow that uh, so then he went to the town and the town had uh, a different view and the town said, uh, no, uh, we're going to deny, deny it. And, you know, there's some standards for variances, and you're, you're really supposed to show a hardship before, uh, before you, uh, you know, the board is to grant it. And so, you know, probably in all likelihood, the town was where they should be, and they, they denied it. And so, of course, uh, now he's into it, and so now they appeal it to the courts, and the court uh, reversed, and they held for the property owner. And so then the Board of Adjustment at the town level, they didn't like that, of course. And so they went to the Court of Appeals. And, uh, and of course, all this is free for everybody, for this fire pit and this, you know, little building that they sat out there. And, um, but in any event, in this particular case, uh, the Court of Appeals held that the uh, town board lacked the authority to enforce their ordinance, their shoreland ordinance, because... Uh, the legislature had, in fact, fairly recently said, you know, that's really the county's job to be doing that. And so uh, they reversed the town, uh, and then, you know, that, that was that decision. And so, uh, you know, that left the towns generally, and, you know, whose rules are we supposed to be following? I mean, we have, the towns have the authority to zone in the shoreland area. Now the, court, the legislature is saying the county can do that. So this, this piece of legislation that I talked about is trying uh, to clear up some of that amb ambiguity and say when, when it's the town's responsibility, when, when it's the county's, and who you're supposed to follow at which particular time. Uh, so the next case I'm going to talk about is uh, another shoreland case, of course. Uh, this is in the county of Walworth, which is down by Lake Geneva, down by Janesville, where I grew up. And this is uh, a case where uh, there was uh, uh, a bar on a lake in Wisconsin. What could be better than that? And uh, this is, uh, these folks had uh, two lots. This bar had been there forever. I want to say it was back in the 20s when they, or 61, seems like forever for me, uh, uh, when they, this bar was there. And the ordinance provided uh, that... Uh, you could have a uh, livery, which I was thinking, what is a livery? And I guess that's a rental of boats, okay? So you could rent boats or you could have a marina, and the marina would be renting the slips that the boats go in. And uh, uh, that was in the ordinance, and the, so the people that had it in 61 had used it for, you know, had it for quite a while. And then I think it was in the 90s that the new owners bought it. And uh, so all along during that time, there had been some boat rentals, and occasionally somebody would have a slip, I think. And uh, uh, then the new owners decided, you know what, this is a great spot. You know, that'll bring people into the bar, bring them into the restaurant. So we need to go a little bit bigger time. So they kind of get into a full-blown marina. 
And that's when uh, some of the neighbors uh, got excited about that. And so the, so the issue uh, became, well, a couple of things. First of all, the property owners, uh, the bar owners proceeded pro se, which means they did it on their own. And as the court said in their decision, the husband, uh, he was, you know, he's representing himself. And so he was kind of trying to testify, but really he was giving his theories on how, how, he should, how they should win. And the court said, you know what, we're disregarding all of that because that's not the way that it works in the court system. Uh, he did ask questions of his wife, and she testified, and they allowed that evidence to come in. And so they were critical of the parties on that part. Then uh, there was two different zonings, one zoning uh, code for, or one zoning uh, district for one lot and another for the other lot. And the court was critical of the county uh, who was uh, uh, trying to enforce this saying it really didn't matter what the zoning was between the two lots. The critical issue in this particular case was what was the use of this property because they had been using it to rent boats prior to this current ordinance coming into place because they bought it in, six, started in 61, the ordinance was in 70, and then there's some changes along the way after that. And so the court said the real critical issue was could they show that they had continuous, this continuous use from the period before the ordinance was enacted, after the ordinance was enacted, and to where they were today. And the court said uh, the county showed that, in fact, these people were renting the slips, and uh, so they met their burden to say that, okay, they didn't have a permit for that, and they were doing it. But, and the property owners showed that periodically over the years that the prior owners and they themselves had used it to, uh, rent boats, but they really hadn't done the renting of the boat slips. And so uh, the decision turned on the fact that uh, it could not be grandfathered because the use was not continuous over that period. And so they, uh, they overturned it and uh, they weren't able to have their marina down there in uh, Walworth County. So there's a few people in Illinois that will have to drive to the bar and restaurant instead of riding their boat over to, the, uh, over to this location. Next one is a uh, decision out of the uh, city of Green Bay. Uh, it had to do with uh, the city and, and uh, the Oneida tribe that was doing a uh, waste to energy uh, project uh, that they had come up with. And this, I wrote in my notes here, it's all politics. Uh, uh, this, uh, the tribe had come in and made this proposal. Uh, it had come before a planning commission. The planning commission looked at it, said it was fine. Uh, it then went to the city council in Green Bay. The city council looked at it. They said it was fine. Uh, the only stipulation they had is that they would comply with all the state and federal rules. Pretty innocuous. Uh, they're going to do uh, this uh, plant, and so that makes sense that they had to do that. They went about going and getting their, uh, uh, their various permits that they needed, and they came down. They got all of those. That wasn't a problem. And they then uh, got their went to the city to apply for the building permit. And that's where the problem started because as they were applying for these other permits, you know, a little bit of publicity, people heard what's going on. And so even though at the beginning of the game, there wasn't any opposition, uh, now that they'd gotten to this stage, people had heard about it, now they had some opposition. And part of it had to do with um, the, because of the heat energy that was being generated in this process, they just, they had stacks, but it was just, it wasn't because they were burning anything. It was just the heat exhaust coming off the project. And, you know, people complained, said it was going to be, uh, uh, you know, an industrial thing in this particular area. They didn't want it. And so they come to the city council, and they're just going to get their permit. And the city council, as a lot of boards do, when you've got a lot of people out in the audience that are opposed to whatever somebody's asking for, a lot of boards say, you know what, I think we need to refer this to committee. And that's what they did. So they sent it back to the planning commission to have a hearing on the matter. And so that's the planning commission. They're the ones that have to take all the flack. They're appointed. They don't even get elected. They're appointed. And so it's standing room only as those things tend to be when people are opposed. And, uh, but the planning commission looked at it, said, you know what? These are the same facts that we had before. Uh, they've done everything they're supposed to do. They've gotten their permits. And so they recommended that uh, the permit, the building permit be granted. And so they come back to the city council. City council, they're politicians. They got a lot of people that are yelling at them, upset. 
And the council votes seven to five to revoke the conditional use permit. And you know what they said was, well, you didn't really, uh, the tribe didn't really explain to them accurately. He made some misrepresentations, but they were pretty vague about that. And and the court, so the tribe appealed the decision, and uh, uh, the a couple of quotes here just from the uh, decision. The court said the city did not identify precisely what information it considered false, nor did it state how it determined the information's falsity. So they were they were a little, and then they go on to say, uh, fickle and inconsistent fairly describes the city's action here. Uh, and so they kind of they kind of beat up on the city. But in any event, uh, uh, so the uh, appeals court reversed that. But currently, that matter is on uh, petition for review to the Supreme Court. So. We'll find out whether that uh, decision gets up, upheld or not. Uh, next one is uh, the farm case. That was down in Lake Delta. And actually, I had some firsthand experience uh, with respect to that case because after this, uh, there, I don't know if folks remember this, but this was, I think it was in 2008, maybe. There was just this huge flood down in the Dallas. I mean, it was devastating. And I, uh, I was down there, and I can't remember why I was in the Dallas, but we were back around, we were back right in this area where this property is, and you know, there were there were houses that were washed away, and there were houses that were standing up here in a bank, and the water was, you know, the level of the water was, at that point, then after that, it had finished, you know, it was 40 feet below that, and half the house is hanging out over the bank. And so it was just a, a devastating uh, event. Uh, and so this case went, came around, well, whether the city was liable for work uh, their responsibility with dealing with this dam. The dam was built in 1927. The city took it over in 1994. Between 1927 and 1994, there had nothing had been done to change, you know, the the mechanics and how this uh, a dam, particular dam, worked. Uh, in 2008, the city did make some structural change to the design of the floodgates. Instead of having the floodgates open to a level of six feet high, the city changed it to a level of four feet high. And the, uh, uh, so the claim of Fram and all these other various property owners whose properties were wiped out, uh, you know, was that the city didn't do that properly. That caused their damage and the city ought to pay uh, to get their homes repaired. Uh, so, but the decision of the court was is that the action of the village uh, in changing the floodgates did not cause the flooding, uh, that the village's failure to prevent or mitigate flooding did not constitute government action, and finally, the flooding event did not constitute a per se taking of their property because their property washed washed down the riverway. And uh, so uh, the, uh, the courts found uh, in favor of the municipality, but when I, when I thought about, when I was reading this uh, case, what it brought to mind to me uh, was just the fact that, uh, you know, we had the 35W bridge come down over here in the Twin Cities. You have this dam situation, and it's just the uh, the infrastructure and, and the lack of, you know, it, it's just, if it's working, you know, you know, there's just, you know, there's limited dollars to go around, uh, and but there's just how many of these infrastructure type things are out there that we don't know about and we aren't going to know about until... Uh, you know something happens and and draws our attention to it. So uh, that was uh, that was that case. The last case is um, has to do with open records. Uh, the presumption and the overwhelming uh, policy in Wisconsin is open records, uh, open meetings, full disclosure, not doing things uh, behind closed doors unless there's some specific exception. And in this particular case, there had been an open records request, but the real issue here was that the person requesting the records. Uh, it was uh, an employee's records that they were uh, from the school district that they were requesting uh, had a relationship. Uh, I don't, I can't remember if they were married or not, but uh, that particular person requesting the information uh, had a uh, domestic abuse restraining order against them. There had been uh, numerous incidents of police reports and stuff like that, and uh, the argument of the person requesting was that, well, the identity of the person that uh, is requesting the records isn't one of the factors that you're really supposed to balance when you're looking, okay, between the public interest, you know, is, there, is it weighted in favor of the public interest to provide these records, or is there some 
other interest that over, uh, overrides that. And the court in this particular case said uh, safety, the safety issue here with respect to this particular individual uh, far outweighed uh, the interest of the particular person who was requesting it. And they said when we're looking at the safety issue, we are going to look at the individual who's re uh, requesting the information and see whether that, in fact, uh, should be released. And so they uh, uh, found in that particular case that the school district was uh, justified in not uh, releasing those records. So there you have it. 